like the music of many composers of the past, and like that of a few contemporary composers, Kurtak's music is authentically sacred. Not because it has explicitly religious themes. There is also art with a religious theme, but which, not having a transcendence of Latus, is not or does not want to be sacred. But because it alludes, in its essence, to a transcendent dimension. In fact, what makes transcendent a work of art is its being permeated by silence. Not silence understood as an acoustic phenomenon, but as a psychological one. Something happens and it is answered. Kurtag describes often with these words his composer's poetics. His words well express the dialogical structure of his music. And it is precisely this dialogic structure that imposes the need for listening. Without that psychological silence that makes us able to listen authentically, in fact, there can be no dialogue, neither with the other outside us, the other persons, or in the case of a classical musician, even a music score, neither with the other within us. The perception of this other within us is therefore the precondition of any dialogue. I cannot listen to the other outside me if I am not able to hear the other in me. Or, in other words, how we listen to ourselves determines how we listen to the other people. At the same time, being able to perceive the other is the result of being listening. Simone Weil expresses a similar concept when she writes, Grace fills, but it can only enter where there is a void waiting to receive it, a void for whose creation the grace itself is responsible. We are therefore open to the transcendence in the sense that our identity is founded on an inexhaustible dialogue, as Hölderlin wrote, we are a conversation. And in my opinion, the music of Kurtag alludes to the transcendent because, in its essence, it speaks about this conversation. Kurtag uses to say, my mother tongue is Bartok, and Bartok's mother tongue was Beethoven. This is particularly noteworthy in an epoch where artists usually prefer to break with tradition. As the art critic Christine Surgin ironically writes, today a painter who would still dirty his hands with brushes and colors rather than devote himself to installations, performance, or things like that, would be seen with some suspicion. And Kurtag indeed dirties his hands. And how? Kurtag does not feel the nowadays widespread naive need of being original by breaking with tradition. Neither he wants to innovate the language for the sake of innovation. Much more, he finds himself and his identity by continuing the tradition, finding his own unique voice while remaining in the traditional frame of a music made of rhythms, melodies and harmonies, entertaining at the same time a healthy and profound dialogue with other personalities with whom he feels a particular spiritual affinity. Bartok and Beethoven, Schumann, Schubert, Bach, and writers like Kafka, Beckett, Hölderlin, Janusz Pilinski, or Attila Jozef. Speaking about poets, we should underline that it's not a coincidence if Kurtag wrote uh, many works with voice the purest and most human musical instrument, which for Kurtag represents, among others, a bridge to the romantic lyrical tradition and to the ancient music, the Gregorian chant, first of all. The poetic illuminations of Kafka, Pilinski, Attila Jozef, Lichtenberg and other poets inspire Kurtag, who translate their poems by illustrating them with music. I would also say that this musical translation is often even more powerful 
than the original written text, and that the poetic text in Kurtak's music doesn't need to be necessarily a great text from the point of its literal equality, but it does need to be a text able to clearly inspire a musical gesture. But the activity of the composer Kurtak is indissoluble from that of interpreter. If in the past composers were almost always also instrumentalists and or singers, today it is quite rare to find the two qualities together. And Kurtak is a music interpreter of such an outstanding quality that some of the best musicians in the world come to him to take chamber music lessons, not only on his music, but on any repertoire. I think we might say that the heart of his teaching is ethical. What is striking, in fact, is Kurtak's constant reference to the necessity of an authentic assumption of responsibility for the smallest musical detail. One should, Kurtak says, deserve a crescendo, deserve a sforzando. My greatest enemy is the one who is already playing the next bar without having deserved it. This is a strong way to say that one who is not listening to the transcendence is not ready yet to take the next step, that is, to play the next note. In other words, someone who is not in contact with the verticality, the transcendent dimension, which in music corresponds also to the immanence of style, cannot move horizontally, the narrative element which unfolds over time. But where does such a strong ethical attitude come from? In the film by Judith Keller, The Matchstick Man, Kurtag describes himself as a cockroach that crawls and seeks to become a human being. He also names one of his compositions made with matchsticks, the cockroach looking for the way to the light. So here we can understand, in my opinion, two essential elements of Kurtak poetics. The sense of guilt, feeling to be an insect, and not feeling worthy, the need of searching and deserving the light or of becoming a human being. By the way, Kafka comes immediately to mind, of course. Therefore, Kurtak's constant reference in teaching to an assumption of responsibility appears, to my eyes, as a reparation, as an atonement of this sense of guilt in order to deserve the grace. From this transcendental sense of guilt derives, in my opinion, also the proverbial dissatisfaction of Kurtak for many interpreters. Kurtak says, for example, the composer has suffered for each note, and those who interpret his music must suffer as well. And referring to the musicians who do not make this painful, empathic effort, he says, it's not my music they do not understand, it's the music. Since Kurtag put so much weight on this, I would like to allow myself to underline some problematic aspects of this attitude. First of all, most people do not share with Kurtag the primary evidence of feeling like an insect, and therefore they cannot share with him the need of accomplishing a gigantic ethical effort to feel themselves less unworthy of the beauty. If you don't feel the sense of guilt, you won't either feel the need of a reparation. Secondarily, such a sense of guilt is intrinsically inextinguishable for the person who feels it, and therefore this trying of being worth of the light appears to be an almost impossible mission. But how to achieve then a good interpretation? Speaking about a recent recording of its ensemble pieces, Kurtak says, the fact that Reinbert, the conductor, always listened to our remarks, the remarks of Kurtak and his wife, and 
re-recorded fragments or even whole pieces makes this publication authentic. So, what is an authentic interpretation? This phrase of Kurtak seems to suggest that an authentic interpretation is when you play exactly how the composer wants. The composer makes remarks, you try to satisfy them until you succeed, and the interpretation is authentic. But this vision implies, in my opinion, the dangerous preconception that any piece would have a right interpretation, namely the version that the composer had in his mind, and that an interpretation is better so far it gets closer to that ideal version. But besides the fact that no one can know how the composers of the past were exactly thinking their music, which would condemn us forever to play and to listen to non-authentic interpretations, I think that an authentic interpretation does not mean to respect literally the will of the composer. The authenticity resides much more in an empathic encounter between the poetics of the interpreter and the poetics of the composer. Obviously, this does not mean that any interpretation is good. The interpreter needs to take distance from his own poetics in order to recognize and to embrace the poetics of the composer. Yet, interpreter and composer are two different persons, and it's normal that the final musical result goes much beyond the initial idea and will of the composer. And actually, this is precisely the reason why there can be endless wonderful interpretations of the same piece. Orovitz, Gould, or even Kurtag recorded, for example, some unforgettable Bach interpretations. Probably those are quite different from how Bach was thinking his own music. And yet, those interpretations are such beautiful, sincere, and deep encounters that I wouldn't hesitate to call them authentic. Seeking for the light in his compositions, Kurtag finds it. But nowadays, we can't find the grace in an articulate narration. The only way to find it seems to recover it in a gesture, in a splinter, in a fragment, in an instantaneous flash of inspiration. And indeed, Kurtag writes very short compositions, finding the grace in purely an archetypical objet trouvé, such a slowly played major scale, like the beginning of Quasi una Fantasia for piano and orchestra, or a slow arpeggio on the empty strings of the guitar, like in Grabstein for Stefan. That's why most of Kurtak's compositions are very short, and even his longest compositions have mostly the structure of cycles of fragments of short illuminations. The already quoted expression, something happens, and it is answered, also catches perfectly the essence of the Japanese haiku. In the old pond, a frog plunges the noise of the water. The sense of this poetic image resides in its time density, in the coincidence of eternity and instantaneousness, which characterizes also the music by Webern, to whom Kurtag is often associated. But if the pieces of the Austrian master can be described as novels expressed in a single gesture, for our light-seeking composer, we could maybe speak, often, of tragedies in a single gesture. In conclusion, Kurtag is one of the most personal artistic voices of our time. His language is rooted in the tradition and at the same time is unique. And to me personally, he is first of all the composer who could find a true legato to transfigure his pain, making it cantabile and giving life in this way to some of the most beautiful and moving music ever written.